Uh, welcome to Nekawa Kitachimowak Walakwanoe. Um, this evening they tell stories. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, the evening. Uh, my name is Ian McCallum, and uh, we've got a, a wonderful sort of two hour session planned um, coming from uh, nominally the Muncie Delaware Nation, which is uh, 35 minutes southwest of, of London, Ontario. Um, but along with my uh, co presenters, uh, Karen. Uh, Moscow and, and Catherine Chupacall, we hope to share uh, some of the work that has been going on on Muncie, Delaware over the past two and a half years in terms of uh, story creation, translation, and, and the artwork that has brought the, um, brought the stories to life. Uh, our agenda um, will look much like this, but we'll, we'll go right into the, the Muncie prayer with Karen. She'll introduce and, and lead us through the Muncie prayer. Uh, there will be the opportunity for the presenters to introduce themselves, um, followed by, by the, some acknowledgements that we'd like to send out. Uh, we're going to have two stories and a poem this evening. Uh, story one will be Wama Chekanishak, which is the, the little people. Um, and during that time, uh, there'll be the, the background to the story, um, the translation process, plus also the artwork. Uh, process that went to bring the story to life. And uh, after that, we'll, we'll have time for questions and comments. The poem, The Missing Airman, will be the second piece. And again, it'll be a similar format where uh, it's the story behind the piece, the translation work, um, and then as well, the and time for questions and comments. And then finally, uh, story two, um, the story of Tecumseh, uh, Jacob tells a story will be um, will be offered up, and that'll be the same process. What's the story behind it in, in English? Um, how did the translation process go? The artistic uh, work to bring the story to life, and then the opportunity for questions and comments. So, without further ado, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to my colleague Karen, who will lead us in the Muncie prayer. It should be up on the screen for everyone to see. Can everybody see that? So um, our Lenape prayer, the first line is uh, the Lenape spelling. The second line is my interpretation of the phonetics. And the third line is English, of course. So if you guys want to um, have your microphones muted and you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. Anishi Kishalamokwang, Elamiliang, Yon Kwai Kishquik, Wak Michwakan, Willam Liswakan, Wak Ni Alan Gomati, Wak Ni Wikian. Anishi Kishalamokwang, Elamiliang, Kukana Aki, Wak Kishok. Walk ni pahum, walk along way walk, walk papatakweek. Anishik kishalamokwang, alamiliang, tinda walk mbi, asino walk kash hung, meat quak walk papach kulashak, mi huskul walk wicha pico. Anishik Kishalamokwang, Alamiliang, Awaya Yisuk, Walk Aweh La Shoshuk, Walk Namasuk, Walk Ach Koksuk. Anishik Kishalamokwang, Alamiliang, Kohamina, Walk Komohomsina, Kukina, Walk Kokwina, Nicha Nina, Walk Kachosamina. Lopi Anishik Elamilian, Yon Kwai Kishquik Wak, Neem Bumausawakanam. Anishik, 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 Anishik. Anishik, Karen. What I'd like to do is offer the opportunity for, for each presenter to, to have you to introduce themselves for, the, for this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Quinganaw Lomwa, um, Anishik Wema Awen, Ella Yo Tali Kwai Kishquik, Neen Dishinzi Karen, Neen Onjiayi Nalahi, 
Nawalotman Wundak Tukwach, Neen Dylan Apawi, Ninola Malsi, Mechkish Octona, Kwai Jishwanaku. So um, I just said it's nice to see everyone and thank you to everyone for being here in this place tonight. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm from Nalahi, which is Muncie, Delaware Nation. Um, and it translates, literally translates as upstream. I follow the ways of the turtle. I am a Lenape person. I'm feeling fine. Um, and I'm finished speaking the language and I, now I will speak English. It's my um, pleasure to turn it over to Catherine Chupik Hall. Hi, I'm Catherine Chupik Hall. I'm in Guelph, Ontario on uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation land territory. I uh, illustrated uh, some of the some of the books that um, you guys are going to see today. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here alongside these incredible people. Thank you. Anishi Catherine, um, and now it leads me to introduce myself. So, Wailak Pishka Kawama Wen, Ni Dashin Ian, Ni Nong Jai Nalahi, Shuk Nuiki An Berry, Nawalotamalundak Tukwa, Ni Dalok Sheshko Halawasak Pombio, Ni Nola Lindam, Match Gish Aptone. So, my name is Ian McCallum. Um, I am from also up the river, and there's nothing better than being upriver and not downstream. Uh, so I'm also from Muncie, Delaware Nation. Uh, I follow the ways of the turtle as well, um, and I'm feeling fine today, and I'm, I've done speaking for now, I think, uh, but not for long. I'd like to offer some acknowledgments, and my co-presenters, if there's anything I've forgotten, feel free to, to jump in. Um, did want to acknowledge that uh, we're gathered here uh, all over North America this evening. Um, it's one of the benefits of working on Zoom and, and working with language and sharing things. Uh, but we do um, ask that you uh, think about the treaty territory that you're on. And uh, because this is a, a storytelling and a language evening, um, if uh, you could acknowledge or, or find out more about the languages, the indigenous languages that were spoken on, on the land that you're currently on, that would be uh, a wonderful term of respect as well. Um, we would like to acknowledge uh, our, our family and, and friends in terms of supporting us for this evening, uh, as well as our, our communities. So the communities of Muncie, Delaware, language speaking communities, um, artistic communities. We'd like to thank the family of um, James Moses, who the poem is about the second poem and the Moses family, they're from uh, Six Nations, they're Delaware from Six Nations, but we wanna extend the acknowledgement out to them for uh, being so kind and generous to share the poem. The, the background to this story is interesting. And of course, when you touch a, such an important figure as Tecumseh, uh, there's a lot of um, stories, there's a lot of connections that, uh, that are made. And I, I found that out um, and I recently shared this story with the London Free Press um, because it was a story that was originally from the London Free Press. Uh, it was related by my, my great, great uncle, um, Jacob Logan, who is, was Alonzo's uncle. So he's from that generation. He was born in about 1845 and, uh, and died in 1935. But he, he related this story to the London Free Press. So I figured, you know, it's a story that he felt comfortable enough to tell a reporter back then. Um, so then I should probably do the right thing and share that back with the, with the newspaper. Um, and I'll explain why this uh, is maybe a less touchy uh, subject in terms of sharing story. So in my family, there was always this, this notion that everybody knew where Tecumseh was buried, but they were never going to tell. So I heard that often from uh, Alonzo um, when I stayed with him. Uh, my grandmother said exactly the same thing. Older people on Muncie would say, oh yeah, we know, we know where Tecumseh is buried. And as an inquisitive kid, I'd be like, you know what? Can you tell me, right? I'm really interested in history. No, nope, can't tell you. <laughs> so you, you gave me this little, you know, teaser. And then you have the, you know, 
the rotten rottenness to not share with me what <laughs> where he's buried this is like one of the greatest mysteries in the world and as an older person now i understand that you know that they couldn't that they didn't want to um, that it was not appropriate um, to share the greater details of where tecumseh's buried uh, but as a you know a five six seven year old kid that just <laughs> i did did spins on the ground just trying to know all about it um, I came across this story when well, it was mid 1990s, maybe late 1990s. And I found a story in what's called the history of Middlemiss. When Middlemiss is a very small little village that borders the Muncie, Delaware community. Uh, it's a non-Indigenous community um, with Indigenous people living there. However, uh, within this was the full story that, that Jacob Logan related to the um to the reporter and the free press and i wasn't really all that eager to wanting to dive into the microfiche rolls and finding the actual article so what i did was i typed it out on the really rather large big computer in the 90s um, because i wanted to save this one this is a piece that sort of was that connection to where uh my family wouldn't tell me where it comes to is buried but here's the story that was related to my disappointment, Jacob, when he told the story, he told the story where he heard things as a kid, but he never said where Tecumseh was buried. In fact, he went so far as to when people asked him to show, he would point them in the completely wrong direction uh, down near Moravian Town, right? So there was that code of uh, that code of ethics right in the Muncie Delaware community, whereas yes, we have this story. Yes, we had a connection to Tecumseh, but we ain't telling where he's buried. Um, the, the story was told uh, in a log cabin, a log home, which still exists. It, it's, uh, it's out at uh, Longwood's conservation area. And the story probably was told in about 1860. Um, if, if Jacob was about, he would have been about 12 when he heard the story, maybe a little bit younger. Uh, but he lived with uh, his dad, um, which was Henry Logan, Henry and Sarah. He probably also lived with his uh, grandparents, uh, who were Abraham and uh, Mary Huff. So the warriors from 1812, the people in this story, had actually come over to talk with Abraham Huff, who's the next generation past. So he would have been born uh, in the 1770s, 1780s, uh, that sort of time period, and probably came from uh, the American side of Niagara or Ohio to come to Muncie. So um, Henry, uh, and who's Jacob's um, father, is, I guess, probably the first generation born at Muncie Town, and, and Jacob would have been the second. But the, the veterans of 1812, Indigenous veterans, uh, came through Muncie Town, stayed with Abraham Huff, where Henry and Sarah live and Jacob lives and proceed to talk about um, the battle, old war stories, essentially. Uh, Jacob later on in life uh, used to drive the veterans from the community into a hotel in London that's still there. It's known as the Greg Hotel downtown where they received their, um, I guess what you call it, it's a gratuity, like a war allowance for having fought in that war. And he used to offer translation services. So he was a, he was a first language Muncie speaker, but he also spoke English. So he would translate on behalf of the warriors when they went to the, the Greek hotel for their money, uh, which meant that his household was a completely Muncie speaking household. The people that came to visit might not necessarily have been Muncie, and they may have been, but that also means that, that Jacob may have known other indigenous languages such as Ojibwe uh, or, uh, or Haudenosaunee might have known Iroquois as well. Uh, part and parcel of Muncie Town being one of, those, um, one of those communities that a lot of people came to uh, because it was one of the few um, places that was, was in existence in Southwestern Ontario after the Americans burned everything in 1914. So, uh, he may have been introduced to a lot of different people who had fought in that war. And of course, the Tecumseh burial, or what happened to Tecumseh, is one of those sort of 
those enduring mysteries, uh, which I found out. And a lot of people have reached out, which is quite nice to, to offer, not necessarily support in terms of where Tecumseh is buried, but they're actually offering support in terms of uh, the story that lives within their own family or family connections with, uh, with Jacob Logan, which is, I think, the true intent of, of why I wanted the, the story to come out is that it gets, um, it gets people talking about, uh, about family stories, family connections. And, um, and I felt that because this story had already been shared, and I'm not giving up anything other than what Jacob talked about in 1931, that I thought it's a respectful uh, piece that can be shared um, because the material is, is available freely. This piece, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, it needs more, uh, more editing. And I, the Wemachek and Ishek needs more editing. It, it's, it's a continuous editing battle. You, you look back and go, oh, you know what, that's not, that's not correct. I got to go back and change the, the language work. Um, so this piece was, has literally been edited right up until tonight's presentation and, and will continue to do so because Karen, Karen needs to turn her evil eye on this piece and really give it a, a go over. Um, arguably, it's easier to read, even though it's much longer. Um, I'm probably going to make a lot of mistakes, but it's, it's, less, uh, it's less involved with difficult consonants and longer words. And that's sort of my first clue as to know, I know it's not in the best uh, way yet. Uh, Do you so mind if I, I Oh, yeah, go bit. ahead. Sorry. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just gonna say like, do you mind if I share a little bit at the beginning and I might like butt in for a few of the images because I think these images have like a little bit more like research and story behind them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what, sure where you are with that. Uh, if that would interrupt like your flow of reading. <laughs> no, go for it. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think for this one, uh, the thing that was really difficult to me, and I, I did express this to uh, Ian, was um, capturing Tecumseh's image in my art style and like maintaining, um, you know, his status, his likeness, um, obviously from like the few images that exist of him, the few paintings and drawings that exist of him, um, like the depictions of him, his clothing, his, his, his image. Um, and um, I suppose just kind of maintaining a balance between keeping him recognizable without, um, you know, uh, making the image exaggerated or offensive or um, like cartoonishly kind of like either a caricature or uh, just so so like softened and, and cartoon, like made into a cartoon that like he loses like, um, you know, like his features or his, um, his likeness. Um, and I think that was very difficult to me because obviously like I didn't want to cross any lines. Um, and I like, um, I guess, which is a valid fear, especially as, um, Oh, no, this isn't of, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, this isn't Jacob, this is uh, Tecumseh. Um, I'm speaking about, um, yes. Oh, sorry, I, I thought this was, I thought that question was directed towards me. Um, yeah, uh, and I think like, this is like a, a pit that I see a lot of artists fall into and, um, you know, like I wanted to like maintain this image of him. Um, and I was thinking the other day, like, especially with this presentation coming up, I was, you know, thinking to myself, like, well, have, did I achieve that? Did I create a recognizable image of this like very important historical figure without, um, you know, creating a caricature or creating um, something that's like unrecognizable or, um, 
it's just just like childish i guess um and i think like the answer that i thought to myself was well i hope not but i don't know like that's not my decision to make i i'm not sure if i've you know if i've if i've hurt anyone and i hope i haven't but um i'm learning and like this is something to like put out into the world and like be mindful of everyone's responses to i suppose that's that's my little spiel so no chic for sharing catherine and you know that you mentioned the difficulty um you know in terms of the respect because of course there aren't any um black and white or colored images of Tecumseh and what it, the person actually looked like. It's all based on historical, um, you know, portraits or, you know, the, the meetings of British officials and, and Tecumseh or American officials in Tecumseh. So there's a real challenge in terms of trying to create the artwork for a, a story like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think just like, especially with like a more a more cartoon digital style, um, I guess the fear is that some like significance might be erased in like the simplification of, of clothing or uh, features or anything like that. Um, yeah, but I, I feel as if I've, I've done my best to portray this person and yeah, that's all. Anishik, um, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna attempt to read in the, the language. I'm gonna try to ignore Karen's eyes and laughter as I muddle my way through this. This is a longer passage, so please stick with me and I will also do um, the English translation as I go. So uh, you can sort of get a sense of uh, the English text that's written in 1931 and now having to translate it into Muncie into uh, 2020. And I, I forgot to mention this, this story took uh, literally two and a half years um, from start to finish, you know, to actually have the nerve and the guts to actually try and work it out. And then to, tr you know, to, to have it prepared as it is tonight. It's a two and a half year process. So, all right, here goes. Uh, in Jacob Tachimo. So Jacob tells a story. There's the details. Uh, Jacob Logan uh, is the originator of the story, London Free Press, 1931. And I should say, he actually told the story before that in 1912. Um, and the, the work will be translated by Muncie Delaware language speakers. And then uh, the illustrations done by Catherine. Uh, that is indeed the, the cabin. So that's the cabin at Longwoods um, that the story was most likely overheard. Next slide. Lawate Piska and the Ngahani Nawanika Katam Noelichin Lenawak Tato Tawa Nemokamas Abraham Ha Leno Shinzo Jacob Fess and Wikwam Mung Li Nekawa Kakan Jewawak Quinik Ta Taker Nakpi and Gizak Ashta Kikai Tecumse Ninguk we wause apinang wak nakalao shka hunzo chitamas chitamaso we Jacob Fesson la chimo mata wawiko shka hunzo a kihi a pahihi a pahihi no I still got it wrong a pahi there a pahi I was dreading that one. Next slide, please. One night, when a boy of 14 years of age, I lay in my bed. Men came to the house to talk with my grandfather, Abraham Huff, my mother's father. An Indian by the name of Jacob Pheasant, Jacob Pheasant was there. They began talking about the war, then the battles, then Chief Tecumseh. My mother, realizing that the conversation was very important, went to the bed and warned the boy to keep very quiet, which he did. Jacob Pheasant told the story, not knowing that the small boy was listening. Mm 
Lawate piskanak mata mata kwelinuak alak nuawak ki ki chatung. Te kamsi longwa naka kishi lachin aya pawani. Naka kishilato nak pin josmak. Lapienda nakawa alak alakimuak ki ki kent tayakwanong. Naka pachimo wak shalat. Chilato longwam kekwasami. Nacha piska in the nakawa alakum alakimuak ki ki tambo. Nguitil longwam. Naka pashimo naya pawani naka zin. Shkahanzuak yon kwai kishkui kni namahil. Tukwindamalk noham nguk wak wama wam. But one night while the soldiers lay in camp near Chatham, Tecumseh dreamed that he would be shot. He told his dream to his comrades in the morning. Again, when they were in camp near Kent Bridge, he called the men and informed that they had, he had again dreamed he would be shot. The third night, as they lay in the camp near Thamesville, he had the same dream. Calling the men up before sunrise, he said, boys, this is my last day. Do the best you can to protect our grandmothers, our mothers, and all our people. Nakawa Patamawewak Ayapawani Nak Pikanja Kikai Yask Lawa Kwewani Nakawa Wita Kep Wita Kewak Tecumsi Kashilahin Pekwish Tambo. Oh, too many X's. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ashta Yaskwa Asha Wilawak Yapi Long. Loanewang Pakwi Sipo Nak Awendam El Tungalons Mata Aquaso Jacob Fesson Dalum Kikai Nak P. Wasawi Nemes Bullhorn Wak Tachan Lunno Loanewang Longwoods Anayang Nakalau, excuse me again Lunaman Wola Koleo Wola Wola Lo Kewak Wak Tapoma Haki Ashta Naka Aquaso. They had their morning prayers as usual, led by the great chief. Before noon, they met the enemy in battle. Tecumseh was wounded a few yard rods from the uh, Thamesville camp. Then, just before they crossed the baseline on the north side near the T River Thames, one of farm always known as Tecumseh Farm. He received the fatal shot, but not instantly killed. Jacob Pheasant picked the wounded man up, and with the assistance of other Indians, Yellowfish, Blue Bullhorn, and another man carried him to the north side of Longwood's Road. His last message was, do your best, boys, and hide my body from the enemy. And then he passed away. Okay, water, do your stuff. Luna walk, Ndelane walk, Haki, Kopinung walk, Achimo Kewak, Jacob Fesson, O Takataleo Kati, Nekawa Mokamak, Mituk Monako, Nakpi, Wachape, Wachapik, Wichapik, Wichapikak, Michilato, Nakpi, Wachapik, Wichapikak, Michilato. We saw in a miss na chipato Tamahikan Nakawa Walahewak Machiai Tamituk Monchuk At Ansanewak Aki Mata Kusht Kanja Kikai Psind Naka Tamahikan Pakandikan Payahikan Kawanzikan Pakshikan Wakwama we re heal and we heen he nook machiai nekawa which we talk machiai to michelle walk which up which up cock walk palik talk 
meter kamachi ayam. The men carried the body some distance into the woods where they held a council. Jacob Fesson said, boys, how can we hide the body? The suggestion was made to find a tree recently fallen by the wind with the roots turned out of the ground. The desired spot was located. Yellowfish, who was a good runner, was sent to find an ax. They used their tomahawks to dig the grave where the tree had been uprooted, scooping the earth out with their hands until the desired depth. Then without coffin, the great Indian chief was buried. His tomahawk, war club, musket, bayonet, knife, and all were placed in the grave with him. When the earth was filled in, they cut the root from the tree and set it back over the grave. Oh, match Gisha Kone. I'm done speaking. Wow. So that's the, that, that's the, uh, the Muncie language workout um, to, that I talked about earlier, where as a, an intermediate second language speaker, you want to try and build up a, uh, a way in which to improve your own language skills and sort of story creation and, and story interpretation is one way you can do that, especially if you're, um, if you live at a distance from the community or um, you don't really have a whole lot of other people you can talk with in the Muncie language. It's one of those, uh, those pieces that you can, you can do, you can write it out um, and then you can start talking and you can start recording it. You can, you can bug other Muncie speakers to have a listen at your, your horrible accent and see if uh, they've got any, um, they've got any tips for you, but maybe I'll leave it there. Uh, maybe I'll pass it over to Catherine if there's something that you wanted to mention about the artwork. Um, there's nothing much, honestly. Um, if you can go back to the cabin image, um, something I just want to point out about this one is, um, the, some of the textures, uh, in the, in the drawing of the cabin are like superimposed from, uh, images of the real cabin. Um, it's like partially photo bashing. Um, I just thought that it added like some some nice like natural texture to it. Um, and also like with this second image, um, I, I guess I just wanted to capture um, the feeling that I feel like a lot of people experience of, uh, you know, it's late at night, you're a child and you're half asleep and, um, you know, your parents are talking about something that you kind of like half understand with their friends. Um, and I think it's just like, I, I suppose, trying to like enter the mind um, and like take on kind of the, maybe the fear or the, or the intrigue that was felt at the time. Um, thank you for the compliments on the, on the image of the fire. It's very nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think just also like as the story progresses, as the artwork progresses, I, I did try to kind of show this, this like feeling of maybe fear or uncertainty or kind of, you know, as if, as if everything's kind of closing in with like the dark skies and the, and the like roots on the tree. Um, but I, I think I also wanted to capture this kind of feeling of tranquility. I mean, like he, he, like the story says that he was, he was awoken three nights in a row and he had this sense of like impending death. He felt as if he was going to die. Um, but I think also like the bravery that comes with that is an acceptance and, uh, an ability to pass off your like duties to, um, your community and you know just say like this is going to happen um it it might as well be very like peaceful and i think just like the strength that's shown in the story is something i also tried to capture yes i agree great job with the x's ian <laughs> i'm very proud it was it was phenomenal yeah thank you so much um
yeah, I'm not sure I have anything else to add. Um, that was sort of my process. Obviously, there was a lot of behind the scenes research in terms of clothing and like textures of clothing. Um, Tecumseh wore a lot of um, like different, um, I suppose, clothing from, from different cultures. He wore clothing from um, like British and Canadian armies. And he also wore uh, clothing from his, his own culture, which in itself was kind of, as I understand, um, uh, a mix of a mix of clothing from all different cultures within First Nations community. Um, yeah, and I, I think sort of capturing that balance uh, was interesting for me. Um, and also just I had a lot of fun with like the textures of the clothing and the textures on um, everything, everything like that. Yeah. I guess an important part that I haven't mentioned is that um, when you're when you're working with the story and you're working with translation, um, the benefit of working with an artist who's going to go and do the research is incredible because oftentimes uh, I'll forget to send uh, images that would be helpful or to be able to describe what's going on. So when Catherine mentioned that she does the research for the work, it's so incredibly helpful as a a language speaker and someone who's working with stories and, and writing them out that you can um, that you can pass something over to someone and that they'll go through the the research process themselves in order uh, to work through the the artwork process um, simply because there just isn't the, the amount of time uh, if you're trying to write things under deadlines for grants or there's a piece that needs to come out uh, in a timely fashion you just maybe either forget to send the images which i've been remiss to do but it's so helpful when an artist is able to, you know, research the time period and really, um, you know, put that effort into the images, which makes it, you know, much for a much stronger story, uh, a story that wasn't illustrated in the first place. So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think also in terms of research, I did a lot of research on um, the weapons. Ian named the types of weapons, and um, then I, I I looked into them. I was like, well. Do we have any images of any in, images of the specific weapons that he used in battle? Um, do we have like likenesses? And I did find, um, I suppose, like recreations um, in museums, uh, which I thought was interesting. Not like in person, obviously, but online. Um, I found recreations or uh, weapons uh, from other people who were close to him, uh, which were similar. And um, I think that like in terms of research, I was in high school when I was like completing a lot of this. Um, I, I think I was in 11th grade. Um, so I think like it was really interesting to kind of delve into these aspects of history, like these details that are often neglected when people are like painting a, like a broader story of these historical figures and these uh, historical events. Um, so I think that was, that was interesting because it, it feels very like connected to, um, the, the history that you're already learning. There are a couple of questions in the chat and also I saw at least one hand raised, um, uh, uh, Bishan had asked why Fesson instead of La wa we could push for pe a pheasant. And because um, I noticed that was it yellow fish, you had that one translated literally, right? So I don't know if you want to comment on the translation, um, Karen or Ian. Um, the reason I didn't translate Jacob's name was uh, because I wasn't sure if it was actually fesson or pheasant. So I've had confirmation from someone who recorded the stories or recorded people on Muncie in 1965 reach out and say oh yeah we we interviewed a, a man named Anderson Pheasant so I wanted to make sure that I I didn't change the story 
uh, the English names in any way other than what I thought may be respectful and I could do. Um, Bullhorn, I couldn't figure out a translation as of yet uh, for that one. So I left that, uh, that person's name alone. But Yellowfish, yeah, I felt confident enough to translate that into the language. Um, and yes, maybe now that I know that it's Jacob Pheasant, I can go back and, and edit that. That'd be awesome. That'd be fun. Nishi, mm -hmm. um, before going to more comments from the chat, I noticed that Loan Brown had um, their hand up. Mm -hmm. Loan? If I'm saying that right, I haven't been in class for a long time. <laughs> um, I have a question for both, both of you, Karen and Ian, and it's kind of too long for me to type it out on my iPhone. So as Indigenous people reclaiming our languages, we hear over and over again these teachings about how our culture is contained in our language, and you know it's such a different paradigm, and it's a different way of thinking and just expressing being in the world. And well, and also I wanted to say Anushik to both of you, because to be in your territories here in Brooklyn and just to hear you, no matter how uh, you might feel like, you know, you want to do better, just listening to you speak those stories. It's like, I can sit here and in real time from a live person, hear somebody speaking the language of this land and it just it's such a beautiful thing i mean that's just so precious it's so precious so again anushik to both of you for all of your efforts with this and to catherine for like being so respectful in illustrating those stories um but what my question is is as you're immersing yourself in your language like that and all those x's and like as you were talking about that struggle I'm thinking, wow, you know, my teachings are that our languages are the land, in part the land speaking through us, right? And then I'm thinking, wow, like I see the challenges you're facing with that, those particular sounds that are so different than English and what it must have been like when it was just all fluent Lenape speakers in these territories of like using these completely different sounds which represent a different way of being and are, do you guys find that the more you step into your language, like, does it, can you feel like changes within yourselves? That's my question. I would, I would like to say for sure, you know, when, when I first started learning the language, um, I used to dream in the language and I'd wake up saying certain words that I didn't know. And it was like before I had a dictionary. So I'd write it down how it sounded to me. And sometimes it would be like, that would be the word that our teacher taught us that week, you know, and I'd just be blown away. Um, but it does give you like a um, like certain connection to our ancestors that it's hard to describe. But you know, I know that we're making them proud by um, speaking in the original language and um, having them. You know, they're they're happy about that. Okay, I have to meet myself. Little puppy. <laughs> you know what, to add on to Karen's comment that the whole respect, um, like you're respecting the, the ancestors by, by choosing to speak whatever language you can. Um, you know, we, I was challenged uh, before my family had to give the, the community um, some distance in the 1980s by saying, you know, well, you got to come you got to come back and help. You got to come back and help the people in any which way you can. And surprisingly, as a non-language person, I found this very an interesting path that I took. Uh, but to your point about the, you know, learning the language and having a better understanding, um, you know, I've gone from being impatient and wanting the answer now to now going, well, I can I can think about um, 
what I'm learning or think about what I'm, I'm right reading. And, uh, you know, those, the muncy words for different things uh, make more sense during different times of the year when you're out in nature. And of course, that's a, a difficult thing sometimes, depending on where we live. But there's so many, um, there's words that deal with the biology and the, you know, the time of year. And um, then you also start to think about the rules of can I, can I do this or do I have to offer tobacco first? Or is there a process by which you're not allowed to, um, you know, let's say tap the maple trees before a certain time? And then when do you pull the spiles out? There's so many, uh, there's so much rich culture and know-how and uh, what to do and what not to do within the language that, um, you know, you, I learn every day. Mishi. There's um, um, a couple more things in the chat. Um, John Moses shared a resource, um, Tecumseh's Bones by Guy Sandini. In case anyone would like to look at that. Okay, uh, Melissa asked a question um, about the editing process. Um, she asked Catherine and Ian, um, and, and um, Karen may have thoughts about this too. Can you talk a bit about the editing process, the back and forth between image and text that you go through to work on a story? So I can imagine the back and forth in the language editing, but then also in the picture and word, image and text editing. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go, I guess. I, and you know what, I'm gonna have to re, I'm gonna give sort of a modern, or sorry, not a modern, but a more up-to-date uh, version of this. Um, so part of what I've been working on for several years is to work on a, on a story that's, that's bilingual, but it's a much, a much longer text about a, um, a veteran from our community. And um, I gave up trying to do both the Muncie and the English versions at the same time. So I'm working in English because it's easier. Um, and part of the process in which I do is I, I try and formulate what the next part of the story would be in the English language with some with some details to go with uh, that next chapter or the next um, page of the story. And then what I do is I try to support it with what historical information I can or any photos of, of family. And then I, I send it to Catherine and ask her opinion on that or how she can uh, how she can interpret or how she can take it in a different way because I'm not an artist. I have zero artistic sense. So I really do rely on, on those who can take these words or take this historic research and make it something interesting that would appeal to people. So it's like a, it's like a back and forth in terms of I can send material um, and then, you know, and I can, Catherine can do a much better job of explaining this, but she, she has ideas that she, she comes back with that could work for uh, not only the mood for the story, but the, you know, the story as a whole and, and see the bigger picture. But may I'll stop it there because like, Catherine can say much better than I can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, just to kind of, I suppose, second that. Um, I think the most rewarding parts of um, the process, like the editing process and the, the artistic process, especially uh, in the current project uh, that Ian and, I are, Ian and I are working on um, is when Ian will send me, um, you know, something, something vague, um, like a collection of, of words or uh, historical documents or even just images of the time. Um, and I'll say, well, we can take it in this direction and he'll be like, yeah, I never thought of that. Um, that's just like very rewarding to me to be able to uh, like offer artistic input on on essentially what is uh, just a collection of facts and uh, make it, I suppose, um, like consumable and readable. Well, not readable. You're doing that part, um, but uh, like translate it into like emotional like images that appeal to uh the reader's emotions is what i'm trying to say um i yeah i i really enjoy that
Another question that's in the chat, and it comes back to um, the Tecumseh story. And it's interesting to think about how it also picks up threads of earlier conversations. That I'm, I'm thinking about how, you know, we're in this, uh, you know, the, the new moon, the beginning of the, the new month, um, the time of year when it's good to tell a story. And it's interesting that the, the question of sort of burial practice has come back a couple of times. And I find myself thinking about that as, I don't know, as being particularly resonant at this time of year. Um, uh, uh, anyway, so Celia Chazelle asked, she says, the story is so interesting. I have a question about the burial. Did it follow traditional practices, no coffin and placing grave goods, weapons and so on in the ground with the body? So sort of coming back to some of the earlier conversations about about that. Um, I wonder if anyone has any comments on that. I don't, I'm not really well versed on, on Muncie uh, burial practices. I, there's an image of uh, that, um, I don't believe it's a missionary, but it was an Englishman who traveled Southwestern Ontario and, and didn't have a lot of nice things to say, but he actually sketched uh, the graveyard at Muncie town in about 1835. And it shows um, what appears to be a, a pyramid shaped um, object on top of the actual grave with two holes cut out of either side. And the holes were for the spirit to either leave and come back uh, as, they, as they needed to. That's the only, the only piece I know um, about uh, burial practices. And uh, so the, then the story talks about this. I assumed just by reading Jacob's words that it was, had to be done in haste because um, the Americans were, had won the battle and they were coming up the Thames River towards Muncie Town. So whatever happened in the burial of Tecumseh had to happen fairly quickly. So I assume that finding the tree and, and bearing the weapons was almost more of a necessity, but it could, it could have included some more traditional aspects. I agree with that, Ian. I think because they, you know, he said that don't let them find me. Um, it was, best to bury him where they could and then put all his things in there with them. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but lots of thanks and appreciation um, uh, uh, that the evening's been inspiring. And um, I love what Nikki said, you all are doing amazing work and we can see how challenging this is yet so rewarding and so beneficial to us all. I was really moved by that. Um, are there any other comments that, um, uh, I don't know if Ian or Karen or um, Catherine, you'd like to say a little bit more? No, I just want an issue for everybody spending their time with us tonight, um, taking the time after a very busy day to, to sort of be part of an inaugural um, storytelling evening. Um, if, if this work interests you, there's a planned uh, history, culture, and language session, uh, weekend session coming up at the end of April, beginning of May, that, uh, that weekend, where we, we share uh, our work um, with the, the broader community over Zoom, because right? our, our community is still closed. And to be respectful of that, you can't meet face to face. So um, there is that opportunity. Yeah, I'm seeing lots and lots of um, comments of thanks um, in the chat, and um, I think everybody's just so grateful for this um, this wonderful evening. Quite an to 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 you, Ian, and to Karen, and to Catherine for for sharing with us, and um, I, I so much look forward to to the future gatherings and um, continuing to build this. And I forgot to say at the beginning, um, Anishik to the Muncie Delaware Nation Chief. Kikai Mark Peters for being here. Give everybody a wave, Chief Peters. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're happy that you know you're you're able to be here too. Uh, Anishik, uh, I, I, I kind of wanted to add, to add to this, this story about Tecumseh because there is a, a little bit more. Uh, I'm aware of Floyd Case's grandfather also has uh, written 
document in the case papers at the University of Western Ontario that describes a similar story, but to just follow it up a bit, that tree that they found that was knocked down by the wind was apparently held down by another tree. And once they cut that tree that was on top of the one tree, the other tree sprung back up. And there he is underneath the roots of this tree that looks like it's been there forever, apparently. So yeah, just uh, wanted to add that. So it's pretty cool uh, information, you know. Thank you. Yo. Finish sequence. Yeah, I, again, I'd just like to thank everyone for allowing me to be here and trusting me with these stories uh, to illustrate and to listen and provide commentary. Thank you so much. Now you all get homework tonight. You got to read to come. <laughs> all of you. You guys stick it out. 46 of you guys get to come. <laughs> there you go. But again, the story, the story will be available for, for everybody once um, once our website's up live at the end of February. So and we can share the link to the website um, to the people who signed up for this gathering so that people continue to get information um, if they would like That's about right. this project. Yeah. Yeah. Anishik. Anishik Wamawan. Anishik. La 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 I was wondering if I could take a minute to introduce myself to Ian. Yeah. Hi, Ian. My name is Jamie Wakash Horn. How are you? Hi, Jamie. Yeah, you know what? I've I've uh, I've seen you. I've heard you got some information. Uh, yeah. You come bring in info. <laughs> I hope so. That's why I said in my comment there, Scobie Logan Part Two. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm I'm really curious about the 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 um, the hatchet that came up with that that was re that was resumed with Tecumseh. Um, I've always had the speculation that maybe that was the one that was given to Tecumseh by Proctor. And that was the one that may have went over to England as a gift when, when Tecumseh, when uh, Scobie Logan went over on behalf of the Muncie as Chief Wabanaki to present a gift to the Queen. I was always curious. So I'm curious, Catherine, of that sketch, if that isn't the actual, well, not the actual, but the, 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 the image of, of the, the tomahawk, the tomahawk or hatchet that went over with Scobie Logan and uh, Chief Half Moon. Um, I'm not sure I can answer this like super accurately. Um, I'm I'm fairly sure it was uh, just an image that I found online of uh, the one that he was uh, that I guess I suppose he like had on hand around the same time. Um, yeah, I'm really not sure. Uh, maybe Ian can provide some more insight. I'm really sorry that. Uh, no, no, that's okay, Catherine. I've done a lot of research on that hatchet, so I I'm curious to what <laughs> Ian has has to know about the hatchet or his thoughts or feelings. And this is just a a um, hypothesis that I have, or maybe a hope. <laughs> that's very interesting, though. Um, I remember doing um, research on on the carvings, and and that's about it. Just kind of the significance. Well, very interesting when Proctor had given that um, that gift to Tecumseh actually it was kind of iconic that they would order these from from France so they weren't even made here in North America so even that artifact itself has a history of of um, capitalism <laughs> not even being made in these territories that these tomahawks you know I, I didn't even I was remiss Mark Mark gave me a picture of the tomahawk and I didn't pass it on to to Catherine so I mean she worked off of of what she could find and I mean, right it's it's the amount of material that you have and then sure. you forget that you don't have it that's a great that'd be a great story unto itself I didn't know that I didn't know that that was uh, that 
that possession of that tomahawk could have. Well, and I don't know either. That's just my guess, Ian. So I'm just curious because your great, great uncle and my great, great grandfather were brothers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if that wasn't, you know, when, when Jacob Logan was 14 and they um, resumed the body of Tecumseh, I'm just wondering if the people that were with um, them just looked at Logan and said, Hey kid, thanks for doing this and gave them the, 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 the tomahawk right i'm curious and if that wasn't the same um item that was given to scoby logan because i mean what do you give a queen right you give something of importance so i'm curious if that wasn't the gift that was given to the queen when he went over on behalf of the muncie that's right yeah and that's i mean that's a complete another awesome story unto itself right I mean, yeah yeah no i was just curious i just wanted to connect and that was always been my um connection between the brothers so i've always just put my own in there <laughs> awesome thank you we'll have to talk more Absolutely.